The president put forward a budget months ago. Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Smith, do you know when the president submitted his budget to the United States Congress? I don't remember, but it was... It was March it was, 9th. It was late. It was due February 1st. Oh, I'm glad you noted that. Chairman Smith, when did the Republicans submit their budget? Uh, you would need to ask the budget. I would need to ask the budget. <laughs> well, Mr. Estes, when did the Republicans submit their budget? Only in the Rules Committee, by the way, could a witness lay blame at the president for being a few weeks late in submitting his budget when his party hasn't submitted a budget, period. You know, all the Republicans squawking about the debt and the budget, and they haven't even offered their proposals in the actual government funding process yet. You guys, it's June. The Republicans in this Congress don't care about the debt. I am so damn tired of being lied to. Hello, my friend, and thank you for tuning in to the 275th episode of Congressional Dish. I'm your host, Jennifer Briney. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about a new law because I feel like I have to. Because we just went through a serious but stupid and unnecessary ordeal that made the United States look like an absolute clown show to the rest of the world. And this is an episode that I saw coming in my crystal ball when the Republicans took over the House of Representatives last year. I warned you that there were a group of anti-government zealots elected to the House and empowered in the last election who were just salivating at the prospect of being able to use a debt ceiling crisis to get their wet dreams into law. And they did just that. But unlike so many others who have put microphones in front of their faces to inform the public about the new law, I read the damn law. I also understand how the budget process works in reality, because I've been producing this show nonstop since the last time the Republicans pretended to give a hot damn about the debt, and when they pulled this same sh** back in 2011 and 2013. And so today I'm going to show you that the real winners of the debt ceiling crisis that just ended weren't the House Republicans or Kevin McCarthy or President Biden, but the real winner was Senator Joe Manchin, again, and the environmental polluters that he's been elected to serve. The bill that became law, despite all the words allowed to be spewed freely by Republicans on cable news, well, this was not a debt-combating law. This was an environmental law. Actually, it was an anti-environmental law. And if you can't tell already, I am spitting mad about it. Not just because I care about the air I breathe and the water I drink and the other species who live in this country and whose lives should matter to us selfish humans, but because none of this should have happened. The Republican Party created an unnecessary crisis and the Democrats let them. And it's helpless animals who are going to suffer the most. I hate both parties with a passion today. And today I'm not going to bother to try to keep my cool about it. It's not cool. And so... If you're one of the many people who for some reason listen to this show, even though you can't stand me, well, buckle up or fuck off. <laughs> you know, why are you even listening to the show if you hate me? Although actually I know why. Because no one else is reading the laws. They report on the politics and they call it news. There's been so much breathless coverage of the winners and the losers by people who don't take the time to learn what the fuck they're talking about. And the coverage on this one in particular has been insufferable to me. From cable news to most newspapers and definitely in podcasts, even ones I like, they pretended the new law was a debt-related law. And they're doing everyone a disservice with their laziness. So yeah, I do know why you listen to this show, even if you hate me. And I am sorry you have to get this information from me. It shouldn't be like this. But it is. And so today I'm going to tell you the backstory of the debt ceiling crises of the past, because the recent history shows clearly why the new law, which I will detail for you, doesn't actually do dick about the debt. But it does ensure that our environment will be trashed for profit. And then finally, because why bitch about the way things are without offering solutions, I and experts who are actually serious about the debt We'll tell you why this crisis never should have happened and how it can be prevented in the future. 
So you ready to get your blood pressure up? Let's go. What is the debt ceiling and where did the debt ceiling come from? Because it is not a normal thing for a government to have. Other countries don't do this to themselves. Well, the debt ceiling is the maximum amount of federal debt that the United States is allowed to rack up. Now, a lot of times the debt ceiling is explained using comparisons to kitchen table financial issues. But you and I don't have a debt ceiling that we set for ourselves. You can keep opening credit cards until the banks decide to stop giving them to you. You can borrow money until friends and family tell you to go bleep yourself. In an individual or family situation, there is no number where if you get that far into debt, you legally can't get any more money. There is no debt ceiling comparison in your life. This is a weird thing that Congress did to us when they created it back in 1917. In 1917, Congress basically made it illegal for us to borrow more from the banks or our friends to pay our bills if we charge too much on the national credit cards. And so every time we hit that too much number, We have to raise or suspend the debt ceiling or we become a deadbeat nation that isn't able to pay our bills. And since 1917, at least in part because the Constitution prohibits the non-payment of our nation's bills, Congress has raised the debt ceiling 78 times, 49 times under Republican presidents and 29 times under Democratic administrations. And let me repeat that. That debt ceiling has been raised 49, 49, 49 times under Republican presidents and 29 times under Democratic administrations. And so far, no Congress under any administration has let us become the deadbeats of the world. And that's because there are consequences to being a deadbeat nation. Here's Representative Jim Himes of Connecticut explaining what would happen if we really hit the debt ceiling and Congress refused to increase it. There will be an office in the United States Treasury, less than a mile from here, in which a group of people will decide, are we going to pay the soldier deployed in Syria to combat ISIS, or are we going to send out Social Security checks? Are we going to pay air traffic controllers, or are we going to support the Medicare program that provides health care for retirees? That's tragedy in and of itself. But the world is going to see something it has never seen before. It's going to see that the United States is no longer trustworthy, that we don't pay our bills, that we don't abide by the obligations that we freely took in this chamber. And this is where comparisons to individuals do actually become helpful, because what happens to deadbeats who don't pay their bills? They lose things. In this case, if we can't pay the people who work for us in the United States, they stop working for us. And even though trashing our government has become such a cool thing to do during my lifetime, the truth is that government workers do essential work for us. Do you want to fly without air traffic controllers? Do you want government workers to stop sending out social security checks to your grandparents or your parents? Do you want to pay their rent or their mortgage or their medical bills instead in cash out of your own paycheck? You know, deadbeats can't pay for things. And so someone else has to. And when the government is the deadbeat, that someone will be you. And you know what else happens to deadbeats when they are allowed to borrow? The bank or the friend wants more money in return for the risk they take from lending to that deadbeat. On a national level, even suggesting that our bills won't be paid can and does have this effect. Our country borrows money from financial firms and pension funds in other countries, and they get to set the terms of the loans when we are the ones who are begging. And because government borrowing helps determine interest rates in general, when the country does something that raises interest rates, it affects your bank account too. Just ask anyone trying to get a mortgage right now. Which means that the threat that the Republicans, the House Republicans in particular, made to the country when they said they would refuse to raise the debt limit unless they got something in return was a serious one that would affect the finances of not just the government, but also you and I in a way that can only make American life more expensive. Here's Senator Chris Holland of Maryland when he gave a speech on the Senate floor on March 10th with an idea of what the consequences of this could be. What exactly is Speaker McCarthy saying to the country? And he's saying this, that if the Senate doesn't go along with the very extreme proposals passed by the House Republicans, and if the president doesn't agree to sign on to those extreme proposals, he will allow the United States for the first time in our history to default on our obligations. And what does that mean? 
it means he is threatening economic catastrophe. Because there's no dispute among Republicans. I don't care if you're a Democratic Republican, excuse me, a Democratic economist or a Republican economist. Economists across the board will tell you that a default would be catastrophic for our economy. Massive job losses. We saw an estimate the other day of 8 million jobs lost in the country. Retirement nest eggs that people have been working a lifetime to build up, imploding. Interest rates rising. The credibility of America around the world shattered. The dollar as the world's reserve currency being called in to question. I can tell you who will be celebrating if this happens, and that's the folks in Beijing, the PRC. They'll be very happy if the United States undermines its credibility on the world stage, and they'll be very happy if we lose our position of having the dollar being the world's reserve currency. Representative Brendan Boyle of Pennsylvania expanded on that in the Rules Committee hearing that took place on May 30th, the night before the vote on the bill that finally ended this stupid, unnecessary crisis, the only hearing that took place about that bill before it became law. But we also run the risk that we will one day not be the reserve currency of the world. The reason why our interest rates are so low comparatively is because we are a safe haven for investment for the rest of the world. These sort of antics increasingly bring that into doubt, whether or not folks will get their money, the folks who are lending to us. And in the last few weeks, there has been even more movement by other countries away from the chaos that is increasingly causing foreign countries to lose confidence in the safety of the U.S. dollar and in the competency of the U.S. government to be a good steward of a global reserve currency. In April, just two months ago, there was a meeting of the BRICS New Development Bank, which is basically the copycat of the World Bank in the global economic system that's being set up to compete with the world trade system. BRICS stands for the founding members, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, not small countries. And since the founding, Bangladesh, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, and Uruguay have also signed up. And then on June 1st, the head of the bank, who used to be the president of Brazil, announced that Argentina, Zimbabwe, and Saudi Arabia intend to be members of the BRICS bank as well. This bank has, since its founding in 2015, said openly and repeatedly that one of its main goals is de-dollarization. One of its main goals is to issue loans to member countries in exchanges of local currencies instead of the U.S. dollar. Because of the dollar status as the currency that everyone in the world trade system trades in, what happens in the U.S. economy affects the global economy. So, for example, when the United States decided to stop policing bankers and other financial corporations during the Clinton and W. Bush years, and the financial products that those institutions invented by mixing shitty mortgages with good ones and labeling those shit stews as safe and delicious, well, when those loan packages that everyone was told were safe made our economy sick, they took down the world economy with them. The rest of the world learned a lesson about trusting the United States to be the center of the world economy and about our competency in enforcing the rules-based order, especially when we punished exactly no one for what happened. Other countries want to protect themselves from the chaos of the U.S. economy with a diversified global currency system. And when the world sees the U.S. Congress threatening to destroy the U.S. economy on purpose— that just accelerates their understandable moves away from depending on our U.S. dollar. And that's especially true when the world has witnessed the U.S. Congress threaten to tank the U.S. economy on purpose over and over again. Now, at first, when the debt ceiling had to be raised, it was in actual crisis situations. So after the debt ceiling's creation in 1917, the first time it had to be raised, but not the last time, was because of a war. So it was raised first in 1946 for World War II. It was raised again in 1954 for the Korean War. But fast forward to 1979, as increasing debt was more of a normalized thing, the debt ceiling was officially linked with budget decisions. In 1979, Congress adopted the Gephardt Rule, named after House Majority Leader Dick Gephardt of Missouri. 
The rule allowed the House to automatically raise the debt ceiling when it passed a budget without requiring a separate vote. So basically, when Congress decided to spend the money, they decided to pay those bills at the same time. Before this was repealed to pave the way for the debt ceiling crisis created by the Republicans in 2011, the Gephardt rule was used to increase the debt ceiling with no drama 15 times. But in an event that foreshadowed the drama to come, drama was threatened by the Republican Speaker of the House who changed how Congress functioned for the worse, Newt Gingrich. In the 1990s, when the White House resident was Democratic President Bill Clinton, but the House of Representatives was controlled by Republicans, Newt Gingrich and friends created a policy outline that they called their Contract with America. And as part of their policy dogma, they created a budget that drastically cut spending on domestic programs, which President Clinton vetoed. This in turn led to a five-day shutdown of the federal government. Speaker of the House Newt then made the unprecedented threat to refuse to increase the debt limit above $4.9 trillion. President Clinton responded to that threat and a second Republican budget that would destroy domestic programs with a second veto, which led to a longer government shutdown of 21 days. In the end, the Republicans passed a budget offered by President Clinton and also raided the, the debt ceiling to $6 trillion. Republicans, in essence, lost that battle. A battle that was more budget battle than debt ceiling during the Clinton years. They then supported raising the debt ceiling with no drama at all when Republican President George W. Bush launched regime change wars on two countries, Afghanistan and Iraq, and charged both of those wars to our national credit card. And when those unpaid bills came due during the following administration of Democratic President Barack Obama, Republicans pulled a page from the Newt playbook of failures and tried to use the debt limit for leverage, and they got their asses handed to them again. In 2011, after the Tea Party wave of government-hating Republicans entered Congress, the Republican Party in the House of Representatives immediately began manufacturing a debt ceiling crisis. And one person in particular in the Obama administration decided that negotiation with the economic terrorists was the right thing to do. Here's Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland. He was in the House of Representatives at that time, and he told a story last month of what went down in the early days of that Congress in 2011. So I remember back in 2011, it was right after the 2010 elections, uh, Republicans had won a big majority uh, in the House of Representatives. President Obama was in the White House, and they were threatening early on uh, to hold the issue of default and threaten to use it uh, for budget purposes. And it's true. I mean, we've, heard, we've heard it said that Vice President Biden at the time came down to the Hill, and they formed a, what was called the Biden Group. And they met in an office right, right around the corner here on this floor of the United States Senate. Uh, I was one of the House members uh, that participated in that. There were a total of about 10 from the House, Senate, Republicans, uh, and Democrats. We had at least 10 meetings. And President, Vice President Biden would begin each meeting this way. He would say, I know today we're going to talk about the cuts that are being proposed by House Republicans. And we'll do that. But I want you to know two things. One is nothing's agreed to until everything's agreed to. And after we go through these proposed cuts, we're going to go through proposed revenue increases. We're going to, we're going to close tax loopholes for very wealthy people. And so we're going to attack the deficit from both sides of the equation. We'll do some cuts, but you've also got to be prepared to talk about revenue. And everybody at the table nodded their heads. Senate Republicans, House Republicans, Democrats. Well, after 10 meetings of discussing cuts, a lot of us were getting concerned that we hadn't really begun to dig into revenues. And Vice President Biden said, you know, I've said at the beginning of every meeting, we got to get to revenues. We're going to do that. And at that moment, the talks broke down. Eric Cantor, who was uh, the majority leader in the House at the time, Speaker Boehner was Speaker, Kevin McCarthy walked out of the talks, largely because he was afraid he was going to be fingered by 
his House Republican colleagues for having agreed to talk about revenues. Imagine that. You care about the deficit, but you won't talk about any ways to raise even a penny of revenue from very wealthy people. And so that sort of exposed the whole charade at the time. And so on July 31st, 2011, only two days before the U.S. government ran out of money and would have had to start refusing payment on some of our bills, the Budget Control Act of 2011 became law. It raised the debt ceiling by $2.1 trillion and was supposed to reduce spending over the following 10 years by $917 billion. It also created what was nicknamed the Super Committee, which was a new committee made up of members of both parties from the House and the Senate who were tasked with writing another bill by the end of 2011 to cut an additional $1.5 trillion over the next decade. And to incentivize the members of the Super Committee to actually do this, well, if the Super Committee failed, the debt ceiling would increase, but across-the-board cuts would be automatically enacted to both domestic spending and war spending. Those across-the-board cuts were known as the sequester. The idea was that Democrats would hate the domestic cuts and Republicans would hate the war funding cuts, and so they would be forced to come together and compromise. But they didn't. The super committee super failed, and the sequester went into effect. But not really, because what happened in the 10 years that the cuts were supposed to be in effect and the trillion dollars or so in savings achieved is that future Congresses just changed the law so that they could spend whatever they wanted. So after the 2011 Budget Control Act became law, in 2012, Congress raised the caps by $48 billion. In 2013, they raised the caps by $62 billion. In 2015, they raised the caps by $80 billion. In 2018, they raised the caps by $228 billion. And in 2019, Congress raised the caps by $321 billion. Congress is empowered to create spending caps and is also empowered to remove them. And recent history has shown us that caps on future spending don't do jack sh- But something more permanent did come out of that drama, something that has been in effect for the full decade that was governed by the Budget Control Act and then some. Because on August 5th, 2011, the Standard & Poor's rating agency downgraded the rating for long-term U.S. government debt, which could have meant higher interest rates on our debt, which means an increase in our debt. Now, we got lucky because there are three rating agencies and the other two rating agencies didn't follow the leader in 2011. And so the impact was minimal. But the gun is still loaded. Here's Representative Teresa Lager Fernandez of New Mexico speaking to another member of the House, Representative Brendan Boyle of Pennsylvania, during the Rules Committee hearing on May 30th. Now, Standard & Poor's, they downgraded our credit rating. Have they increased our, have they uh, raised that credit limit rating? Uh, No, there are three credit agencies, uh, Standard & Poor's, uh, which was the one that downgraded us in 2011, um, never increased our, uh, uh, never reversed their downgrade. Um, And frankly, my concern and the worry right now is that the other two credit agencies will now follow suit, uh, given the events of of the last couple months, which obviously look very much like uh, 2011 all over again. And so, in summary, what the Republicans accomplished in 2011 were fake reductions to the debt and a downgrade to our national credit rating from one of the three credit rating agencies. And so, two years later, in 2013, they threatened to tank our economy again using similar tactics, but with a different legislative goal. This time, they would attack the Affordable Care Act, which was a law created by and enacted by the Democrats and the Democrats alone, which was branded as an overhaul of our horrible for-profit healthcare system, but that in reality kept the same awful system with insurance companies acting as profit-sucking leeches who control healthcare billing. But thanks to the Affordable Care Act, those insurance companies would now have to follow some rules. Before the Affordable Care Act, the insurance companies could charge whatever they wanted, and then they could drop whoever they wanted for whatever reason and deny our claims for their own reasons. Their pursuit of profit had essentially no boundaries, and so Democrats put in place some boundaries, like 10 essential health benefits that the insurance companies have to pay for in return for our premiums, benefits like annual physicals or hospital stays or emergency room visits, really basic sh- The Republicans wanted those rules to go away, and in 2013, they threatened to tank our economy to get the repeal of those new rules on the insurance companies. 
And if that sounds insane, because it would so clearly hurt so many of us, and if you doubt my summary of what happened because it sounds so insane, feel free to go back to the Congressional Dish episodes of that era, because I read the entire Affordable Care Act. I know exactly what that law did. And then I read the American Health Care Act, which was what the Republicans tried to replace the Affordable Care Act with. Both of those episodes are in the show notes for you. But I have compared the health care policies of the two parties on a level of detail that very few people have. And I promise you that the Republican health care proposals were designed by and for the health insurance companies so that those companies could profit more and you would pay the difference or go bankrupt and or literally die trying. And I honestly believe that one of the reasons that the American people still vote for Republicans after what they tried to do to our health care system is because the American people don't believe that their proposals could possibly be as bad as they were. Republican voters either didn't know the details, which is very likely, or didn't believe that they could possibly be so awful. Someone had to be lying. It was the Republicans who were lying. <laughs> but anyway. The 2013 debt ceiling crisis. That was the Destroy the Affordable Care Act debt ceiling crisis, which began when the debt ceiling established by the 2011 debt ceiling crisis was hit. And fortunately for Republicans, unfortunately for everyone else, the timing happened to coincide with the annual government funding deadline for discretionary spending, which is the kind of spending that Congress hands out every year. And so every time that I've read a 2000 plus page government funding law that was passed 30 seconds before Christmas and without enough time for anyone to read it, discretionary spending is what we're looking at in the episodes about those laws. In 2013, the government funding laws were supposed to be finished on September 30th, but they weren't. They very rarely are. And on top of that, because of the debt ceiling, the government was going to be unable to pay all of our bills starting in mid-October. And so while 2011 was an attempt to use just the debt ceiling as leverage to get what they wanted, in 2013, they threatened to not pay our bills and shut down the government. It was a two-for-one crisis situation. And so Republicans who controlled the House of Representatives in 2013 basically refused to fund the government or pay our bills unless funding to enact the Affordable Care Act was slashed, along with other policy changes that would have benefited insurance companies. And President Obama and the Democrats this time just straight up refused to negotiate with the Republicans and the government shut down for 16 days. And most Americans, even the most politically disengaged of whom knew that ripping up rules placed on insurance companies had nothing to do with the debt ceiling. And so Americans, not seeing the connection there, blamed the Republicans rightfully for the whole thing. In the end, the Republicans failed completely. The law that reopened the government and raised the debt ceiling did not include significant budget cuts and did not destroy the Affordable Care Act. And if you are wondering why our health care system is getting worse and worse anyway, despite their inability to destroy that law, with insurance companies constantly denying claims that should be paid and requiring us to pay for more and more of our health care out of pocket in addition to our premiums, well, that's because the insurance companies have had 13 years to pay brilliant lawyers to help them figure out how to get around the Affordable Care Act rules, which is why insurance companies shouldn't be allowed to be in charge of our health care system billing anymore. But that's a rant for another day. But back to the shutdown of 2013. After the shutdown ended, the ringleader of the anti-Obamacare crusade, Senator Ted Cruz of Texas, who was not punished for any of this and has since been reelected by the residents of Texas, well, he was bummed about the Republicans' total failure. The deal that has been cut provides no relief to the millions of Americans who are hurting because of Obamacare. The deal that has been cut provides no relief to all the young people coming out of school who can't find a job because of Obamacare. They wanted to kill President Obama's signature legislative achievement. They wanted to use the debt ceiling and government funding as leverage in a policy debate that had nothing to do with debt or funding, and it didn't play well. And so they seemed to have learned a lesson, but they didn't apply it for another decade. Not because the debt ceiling wasn't reached again, it was, but a Republican became president and they not only raised the debt ceiling three times, but suspended it, allowing it to increase by infinite amounts until certain dates. So first, the Republicans suspended the debt ceiling in March 2017, which was when Republicans controlled all of Congress and President Trump was eating McDonald's in the White House. They then suspended the debt ceiling again in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey, which was the one that drowned Houston, Texas in the summer of 2017. 
And they suspended the debt ceiling again in February 2018 as part of the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018, which ended the 2018 government shutdowns. All three of those suspensions were enacted by Republicans when they had full control of Congress and the White House. And it has been increased or suspended a few times since then, with no drama when the Democrats had control of Congress. But in the midterm elections of November 2022, Republicans won the House with a very slim majority. And January 19th, 2023 is when Treasury hit the $31.4 trillion debt limit. And this time, the most extreme economic terrorists in the Republican Party wanted to use the old playbook to try to dismantle the Biden administration's signature legislation, just like the Tea Party tried and failed spectacularly to do to the Obama administration in 2013. Here's Representative Chip Roy of Texas on the House floor on May 25th. What are Republicans doing? Running away, saying, well, they'll never give up their Signature Inflation Reduction Act bill. Bull. They'll give it up if we take it to them and hold the line for the American people. Stand up and hold the line to my Republican colleagues against the worst form of corporate cronyism I've ever seen on the floor of this body. But... Showing political savvy that, I must say, most of us didn't think he had in him, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy of California didn't listen to people like Chip Roy and instead did something much smarter, and at least in public, he branded their effort as being only to constrain the debt. In 2013, ripping up rules placed on health insurance companies clearly had nothing to do with the debt ceiling, and even the least politically knowledgeable Americans could figure that out on its face. But constraining debt in return for raising the debt ceiling? That was a cause that at least made some sense. Reduce debt for a debt ceiling increase. Debt, debt, debt. It's all about the debt. And so the Republicans again threatened to take our own economy and said, said it was all about the debt. Now, process wise, up until the beginning of May, the Democrats were insisting that there was only one acceptable way forward in regards to raising the debt ceiling. Here's Representative Sidney Kamlunger Dove of California. President Biden and Leader Jeffries and Schumer have all made it crystal clear that we must pass a clean debt limit and honor our commitments. No other option. And here's leader of the Democrats in the Senate, Senator Chuck Schumer of New York. The solution here is staring Republicans in the face. Do what we have already done under President Trump and President Biden, under both Democratic and Republican majorities. We should pass a clean bill to avoid default with no brinksmanship, no hostage taking. If we do that, there will be no default on the national debt. And he correctly identified when budget negotiations should and do take place every single year. Now, Speaker McCarthy will have plenty of say over the budget in the appropriations process. That is the proper place to have these debates, not during conversations about the full faith and credit of the United States. But the past is precedent now. Here's Senator Mitch McConnell, the leader of the Republicans in the Senate, on May 10th. Seven of the last ten debt limit hikes came with a bipartisan deal on spending levels. Let me just say that again. Seven of the last ten debt limit hikes came with a bipartisan deal on spending levels. Which is technically true. With the notable exception of 2011, those hikes were more in the spirit of the good old Gephardt rule. Those debt limit increases were raised when the budget was passed. They were raised at the same time. This is different. This is do what we want or we won't raise it. That's not what happened during the Trump years or the early Biden years. The debt ceiling hasn't been held hostage in this way in the last decade since 2011. But this is the spin. The spin is that negotiations in return for raising the debt ceiling are normal now. And Biden himself helped normalize it in 2011 by forming that Biden group and negotiating a budget in response to threats to the debt ceiling. And his capitulation as vice president, his spirit of bipartisanship, was thrown back into his face by his former congressional colleagues. Here's Senator John Cornyn, Republican senator from Texas, giving a speech on the Senate floor on May 9th. I believe President Biden, when he was in the Senate, voted for that sort of coupling of spending reforms and debt ceiling increase. I think it was four times. Memory serves me correctly. You know, there were so many signs that this would happen when the Republicans took over Congress. I called it. You heard it. At least if you've listened regularly to this show since the fall of 2022. 
And if I could see this coming, so did the Democrats in Washington, D.C. And yet in the last Congress, when they had control of all of Congress and the White House, they did nothing to prevent a Republican debt ceiling crisis when they had a chance. Another thing the Republicans threw back into their faces. Here's Representative Jason Smith, Republican of Missouri, in the Rules Committee hearing the night before the vote. I should note for my colleagues that Democrats could have raised the debt limit last year when they controlled the House of Representatives. Yup. But here we are. And the Republicans said they were willing to destroy our economy to get what they want, that they would not pass a bill to raise the debt ceiling unless they got what they wanted, like spoiled children. And this was not something that was implied. It was out in the open. Here's Republican Senator John Cornyn of Texas on the Senate floor on May 16th. My Republican colleagues and I have said over and over that a clean debt ceiling is not an option, a clean debt ceiling increase. It simply doesn't have the votes to pass the House or the Senate, making it a non-starter. So we should move on. In order to have a chance of passing both chambers of Congress, a debt ceiling increase must come with some spending reforms. This is economic terrorism. The president can say, I'm not going to negotiate. He will negotiate if he wants to avoid economic catastrophe. You will negotiate or we will kill the economy. And so the Democrats negotiated with the economic terrorists. Here's Senator Chuck Schumer of New York on May 10th on the Senate floor explaining what went down when those negotiations began. Now... On default, yesterday afternoon, I met with President Biden, Speaker McCarthy, Leader McConnell, and Leader Jeffries at the White House to discuss how we can take default off the table while making separate progress on an annual budget. There was bad news and good news coming out of yesterday's White House meeting. The bad news, Speaker McCarthy refused, absolutely refused, to take default off the table. He was the only holdout during yesterday's meeting. President Biden said that no matter what, default should be taken off the table. Leader Jeffrey said default is off the table. I committed to taking default off the table. Even Leader McConnell said unequivocally that no matter what, the U.S. will not default. But Speaker McCarthy, Speaker McCarthy alone, refused to take the threat of catastrophic default off the table. I asked pointedly, I asked him pointedly if he would join us. But during yesterday's meeting, he was the sole holdout. Instead of taking default off the table, Speaker McCarthy is taking default hostage. If anyone wonders what the biggest problem for avoiding default right now is, it is Speaker McCarthy insisting he'll exploit default to push a hard right agenda. But it wasn't just Speaker Kevin McCarthy or the government-hating moron wing of the Republican Party in the House of Representatives. It was the whole Republican Party in the House. And we know that because there was a discharge petition in the House of Representatives that would have raised the debt ceiling and ended the whole crisis. A discharge petition in the House of Representatives is a document that demands a vote be taken regardless of what the Speaker of the House wants. It would be a runaround of Speaker Kevin McCarthy, and it's not an easy process, and it hasn't been used successfully since 2002. But the thing you need to know is that it requires the signatures of the majority of the House of Representatives in order for it to work. But here's what happened. Here's Democratic Representative Steve Cohen of Tennessee. I signed a discharge petition along with all of my Democratic colleagues to bring a clean debt ceiling bill to the House floor. But we couldn't get just five Republicans to join us to force that vote. The entire Republican Party in the House supported this effort. Not even five of them would part ways with Chip Roy, Lauren Boebert, Matt Gaetz, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and the other Republican scapegoats for the chaos of this Congress. They're all economic terrorists. And when they said that they were doing it because they care so much about our nation's truly unsustainable levels of debt, based on what they actually got into law, they were entirely full of shit. So... As was reported by literally everyone, the Congressional Budget Office, the nonpartisan nerd factory that analyzes bills and laws for their effect on the debt, projected that the budget deficits would be reduced by about $1.5 trillion over the next 10 years because of the new law. 
They came to this number by comparing the results of the new law with their previous projections for the debt increases that they had produced just in May of 2023, which assumed that the current government spending levels would increase at the rate of inflation. The CBO analysis said that damn near all of the savings from the new law, $1.3 trillion out of $1.5 trillion, would come from just one part of the budget, the discretionary domestic part of the budget. Explaining the significance of that, here's Representative Mark Pocan of Wisconsin on the House floor on May 16th. We have discretionary and non-discretionary spending. We can't cut non-discretionary spending like Social Security and Medicare because, well, it's your money that we hold on to as a public trust. So by law, we can't cut non-discretionary spending. That only leaves discretionary funds that can be changed. Now, discretionary funds are eligible for cuts or increases, but the GOP majority further limits that by saying uh, they won't cut Pentagon spending. That amounts to over half of discretionary funds. That leaves a much smaller portion of the total budget to absorb all the cuts they propose, adding up to a 22% cut of all remaining funds. 22% of the funds that help veterans. 22% of the funds to protect the border. And funds for Meals on Wheels programs. And funds for railroad safety inspections. Education, housing, health care. All cut. And that's exactly right. Although I don't know about the 22%, but the idea is exactly right. And so let's look at the numbers in this new law. So the new law sets spending caps for fiscal years 2024 and 2025 at over $886 billion for defense and over $703 billion for non-defense. But a factor that is like never mentioned for some reason is that that $703 billion non-defense category includes expenses for veterans and military construction projects, as if healthcare for ex-soldiers and military construction projects aren't war expenses. I've always considered this a budget gimmick to make it look like we spend less on war than we actually do. In 2023, Congress provided about $315 billion for veterans and military construction projects. And so, assuming that there will be similar amounts provided in 2024 and 2025, the real figures, if Congress were honest about what's in the war category and what is not, well, the real numbers are more like $1.2 trillion for war and the consequences of war and $388 billion for everything else. And so if Congress intends to fully fund veterans health care, as we promised those that risked their lives for us that we would, if the PACT Act money is actually provided, and it f***ing better be, well, then that means that all of the Republican cuts are intended to come from just the $388 billion that is spent on us. The $388 billion that funds programs to keep us from starving and dying when we face tough financial times. The $388 billion that funds law enforcement agencies that keep or at least should keep, poisons out of our food and our air and water unpolluted and keeps trains on the tracks and keeps criminals from ripping us off and that keep the border secure. All of the cuts would have to come from that relatively small money bucket if the Republicans get their wish. And so that's why the cuts are branded as extreme. But here's the thing. Most of those cuts in the new law are not specific. And so all of the fear about this is about spending bills that are yet to come. The cuts are mandated via spending caps, just like they were in the 2011 Budget Control Act, via spending caps on the spending decisions of future Congresses. And what did we learn from the 2011 Budget Control Act? We learned that future Congresses are going to bust through those caps anytime they want to, and that the U.S., which has done essentially nothing to adapt to a rapidly changing climate, will experience natural disasters, which will require unexpected spending. And so this new law is likely to do damn near nothing to reduce our nation's level of debt because it wasn't designed to. And furthering my point on that is a provision that is also a Tea Party zombie idea that didn't work before. And so let's try it again. And that's automatic spending cuts if Congress fails to do its job. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the sequester zombie. Now, this time, there is no super committee, but the same dumbass idea is theoretically going to get the old ass children in this Congress to compromise. The idea is that if proper government funding laws are not in effect at the beginning of the next two years, if we are at New Year's Day operating under a continuing resolution, which is essentially an extension of current funding levels because of the Congress babies didn't do their homework, Well, if that happens again, then there will be a 1% cut across the board in both war and, you know, partially not war categories. 
The recycled idea is again that everyone hates a sequester. Republicans hate cuts to the military. Democrats hate cuts to non-military. And so everyone is incentivized to grow the fuck up and do their jobs. Except recent history has already taught us that this strategy doesn't work because the super committee failed and the sequester happened. But Congress just changed the spending levels manually over and over again, and the debt continued to grow. But just because these spending caps and sequester threats, as recent history has shown us, are unlikely to do anything about the debt, that doesn't mean that this new law didn't enact cuts that will make it harder for public servants to do their jobs and that there weren't cuts that will harm people. The real cuts were pretty much glossed over by anyone who informed the public about this new law because the real cuts took some digging to figure out. The part of the law with the consequential cuts is the one reported as having clawed back the unspent COVID relief funds. This part of the law has been basically dismissed as unimportant because the public emergency was declared over. And so, yeah, let's just take back the money that was left on the table, except it doesn't work that way. The so-called COVID relief funds were actually over 60 different programs that were funded in at least three different laws that were passed during the pandemic. Three laws that I read and outlined for you during that crazy time. And to figure out what was rescinded, you had to go through all 60 something lines of rescissions and look up the original laws to see what was defunded. And of course, these were not organized in a way that made that easy. You had to jump back and forth between the old laws. You know, this wasn't easy, but if my dumbass can do it, then it's certainly possible for the millionaires on TV to assign the project to an intern. And what the no one who bothered would have found is that the money was taken away from agencies with all kinds of responsibilities and taking money back from them is fucked up. Because the way that those three laws gave out most of the money was that they gave the agencies a certain amount of money and then gave them a date that they had it until. An administrator of these programs, if they were budgeting wisely with our money, would probably have looked at how much money they had, how long they had it, and plan to stretch it out to meet the needs of our communities as long as possible. But what Congress just did was basically say, ha ha, suckers, you didn't use it, you lose it. Wise budgeting was essentially punished with this move, and it wasn't just COVID-related expenses that were hit with congressional take backsies, although COVID management funds were certainly hit. And so as far as COVID provisions are concerned, money was taken back from the Public Health and Social Services Emergency Fund. Money was taken back from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, specifically their COVID vaccine activities and vaccine supply chains. So if you want another vaccine, that's coming out of your pocket now. They also took back all the money except $7 billion for COVID testing and mitigation. They took back all of the SARS-CoV-2 genomic sequencing money except for $714 million. And they took back all of the money for COVID global health programs and international disaster assistance funds for the State Department, despite the fact that people are still dying from COVID. Just because the emergency is over, that doesn't mean that COVID went away. We decided to reopen our society completely, as we should. But with that, if we are a responsible society, we would continue to fully fund testing and especially the research into mutations of the virus. You know, do we really want to be caught off guard by a return of a deadly version of COVID? And to that end, we should also fund global health programs so that other countries could catch up to us in terms of vaccinating their populations to make more people, humans on the earth, immune so that it can't circulate and mutate as easily. This whole idea seems very short sighted to me. On top of that, money was also taken away from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So money was taken away from health care for old people, health care for poor people. It was taken away from community health centers. It was taken away from the National Health Service Corps, and it was taken away from the nurse corps. And they took money away from mental health care for medical service providers, many of whom have PTSD from what they went through in 2020. You know, remember how grateful Everybody was to our doctors and nurses in 2020. The people going outside in New York City and banging pots and pans to show our appreciation. Well, I know that I consider doctors and nurses to be angels on this earth, and not just during a COVID pandemic, but every day. Well, this Congress, with your money and in your name, basically was like, you know what money you thought you had more time to use to provide health care to the elderly and to poor people and to local communities or to yourself because you're all fucked up from what you just went through? 
Well, ha ha ha, you didn't use it, so you lose it, bitches. And speaking of sticking it to the bitches, the new law, as insisted upon by the Republican Party, also took money away from survivors of sexual assault and from child abuse prevention and treatment programs and from funding for pediatric, as in children's mental health care access. So how's that for being the party of family values? And not to be left out, the Republicans also made changes that will affect grandma and grandpa as they defunded housing for the elderly and housing for people with disabilities. Because it's not like we have a visible housing crisis in cities all over this country or anything, with a lot of the homeless rolling around in wheelchairs. And just in case you think that Team Rural Red State was just sticking it to us godless heathens in the blue, blue cities, no. They also took money away from rural health care programs and from state and local agencies that didn't blow through all of their cash right away. Smart budgeting was punished in all of the states and cities, red and blue, large and small. The Republicans also tried to make it harder for hungry Americans to get food in this law, but their efforts seem to have backfired, which happens when a law is crafted behind closed doors in rushed fashion without a single hearing with experts who can analyze its likely effects. So before the new law, in order to receive government-provided food for more than three months in a three-year period, able-bodied people whatever that means, have to work at least 20 hours per week or participate in a work program for 20 hours per week unless that person is under 18 years of age or over 50 years old, is medically unable to work, is a parent with dependent children, or is pregnant. The new law, as demanded by Republicans, increases the work requirement age over the next few years so that it becomes 55 years old instead of 50. But the Democrats also fought for it and achieved some changes as well. They got a provision included that adds homeless individuals, veterans, or foster kids until they are age 24 years old to the list of people exempt from the work requirements in order to get food. Both of these new provisions expire and the qualifications revert back to what they used to be on October 1st, 2030. But what I find hilarious about this is that the CBO estimates that all of the changes to work requirements for people who need to eat would increase direct spending by $2.1 billion over the next 10 years, which is a drop in the bucket, but it's an increase nonetheless. And the reason is that approximately 78,000 more veterans, homeless Americans, and young adults from the foster system will be able to eat in an average month without having to pretend to have a job or having to take a job that pays so poorly that it doesn't disqualify them for food stamps. Now, 78,000 additional people might sound like a lot, but it's just an increase of 0.2% of the people receiving food benefits in the United States right now. And so one thing that I do like about this new law is it's actually going to help some people who need it, despite the attempts by Republicans to make it harder for Americans in their 50s to eat if they have no money. But these changes are going to also help some people make money because there are costs associated with making food an administrative nightmare to get and with changing the structure of the nightmare from time to time. Here's Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts speaking on the Senate floor on May 15th. But, you know, there is one group that profits from making the eligibility maze more complex. Private contractors private contractors that make their profits by kicking recipients out of the programs or otherwise trapping them in a cycle of poverty. Maximus, for example, has earned $1.7 billion in the last decade administering red tape for more than half the states. But it has been caught shoving poor Americans into unsustainable, poverty-level jobs or even totally unpaid work, and then Maximus gets paid when these workers cycle repeatedly on and off, on and off welfare. Work requirements are obviously corporate favors by forcing people to take shit jobs in order to eat, but I had never considered the profitability of administrative hassles before. It just seems like there's always some corporate middleman taking a cut, doesn't it? Anyway, back to the new law, there was one provision that would raise money for the federal government. Just one. The only revenue generating provision that the Republicans would allow. Here's Representative Ron Estes, a Republican of Kansas in the House Rules Committee hearing praising this provision. The Fiscal Responsibility Act finally ends the federal student loan moratorium and the so-called interest pause. 
effective August 31st, 2023. For every month borrowers were allowed to skip payments, $4.3 billion were added to the American taxpayer's debt. 41 months later, the moratorium has cost American taxpayers approximately $176 billion. Borrowers here are students. They're generally just barely out of the children category. They are fresh out of high school, people who took loans they didn't understand in order to educate themselves. And so can we just take a beat to contemplate how absurd it is that we tax education like this? That our government makes money on educational loans with interest that take decades to pay back? Because make no mistake, that interest is a tax to government and to private bankers, of course. But our government does make money off of student loans and what a short-sighted policy. Because in a society, to shape societal behavior, you're supposed to tax the things that you want to discourage. So like we tax cigarettes and booze because they cause cancer and increase accidents, which increase healthcare costs in our society. We tax plastic bottles to discourage their use and to recoup the pollution costs. Same with plastic bags. But we also tax higher education. Who benefits from this? Well, only a group of financial elites who want us to be uninformed and who want us to be unable to compete with their spoiled rich kids, only that group would want to tax education as a way to raise money. And only a group of financial elites would also want to enable tax dodging by the wealthy. And the Republicans who serve those financial elites did just that in this law too, by taking approximately $1.4 billion away from the Internal Revenue Service. Here's Representative Jason Smith of Missouri. He's the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, explaining in the Rules Committee hearing why they landed on $1.4 billion as the number to take away from the IRS. So we've been asking for the IRS to give us a plan of how they wanted to spend the additional $80 billion that they had. One, um, they finally gave that to Congress about six weeks, eight weeks ago. Um, they broken down how they were spending the $80 billion. $1.4 billion of it was for hiring more agents. And what the, the, the bill before you does, it eliminates that $1.4 billion for this year. By preventing the IRS from hiring more agents and making it harder for them to catch tax cheaters, the CBO projects that this will increase, increase, increase the debt by $2.3 billion. Now, again, that's kind of a drop in the bucket, but an increase in the debt fought for by Republicans was put into this law nonetheless. And here's the reason behind why reducing IRS funding reduces income for the United States. Here's Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland. And all this talk about the IRS agents, you know, Republicans say, let's get rid of the additional funds to support IRS agents. These are our IRS agents that are going to go after very rich tax deadbeats. And in fact, the Congressional Budget Office projects that if you invest in that effort to go after very rich tax deadbeats, you actually raise revenue. So the action that the House took in this regard actually increased the deficit and is just protecting folks who make a boatload of money from paying the taxes that are already due and owing. So, so far in this new law, real cuts have been made to health programs, housing programs, victims programs. Well, at the same time, the authors put provisions in that are easily changed to pretend to make future cuts to spending. The Republicans also got tricked into increasing food programs for hungry Americans, and they increased the debt by helping tax cheating criminals get away with their crimes. But those provisions were the sideshows, despite getting damn near all of the attention, because the real legislative accomplishments were achieved on behalf of polluting industries. Because one real legislative accomplishment was a pet project that Senator Joe Manchin has been pushing for for a long time now. It's a project he tried and failed to get approved in the Inflation Reduction Act, but he finally got into law as part of the hissy fit thrown by the party of fossil fuels. The new law approves the completion of the Mountain Valley Pipeline, which will carry fossil fuel gas from West Virginia to Southern Virginia. Here's Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia on June 1st on the Senate floor. If you believe in energy security, if you believe in energy independence, and you believe that we should be the superpower of the world, this helps us do that. It puts more product in the market than anything that we have available. This will be up and running in six months. Six months. Already 293 miles already built. We only have 20 more miles to go to finish it. It's time to finish this project. 
And why wasn't it finished? Here's the other fossil fuel loving senator from West Virginia, Senator Shelley Moore Capito, speaking on the Senate floor on that same day. The Mountain Valley Pipeline is 95 percent complete and would be finished today if it weren't for the rulings by the Fourth Circuit that have stayed or vacated multiple approvals granted by federal and state environmental regulators. The Fourth Circuit has acted nine times with respect to the Mountain Valley Pipeline. In eight of those nine occasions, the court has either stayed or vacated an approval from a federal or a state agency. Only once did the court uphold an approval for this project, and that was when the court upheld water quality certifications from the state of Virginia under Section 401 of the Clean Water Act. But within days of that opinion, the same Fourth Circuit panel vacated similar 401 water quality certifications from the state of West Virginia. Because certification from both states is necessary to allow the Army Corps of Engineers to issue a required 404 permit for the Mountain Valley Pipeline, vacating certification from one state has had the effect of continuing to prevent the project from moving forward. And according to Virginia Senator Tim Kaine, this was a factor as well. I object on behalf of Virginia landowners. If you could build a pipeline in midair, that's one thing. But the only way to build it is to use eminent domain to take people's land. Virginians don't want to have their land taken for a pipeline unless there is a thorough process where they have all the rights accorded to them by law, administrative agency, and judicial review. Cutting off those rights is disrespectful to these landowners who, in this part of the state, sometimes land's all they have, and it's been in their family for generations. But despite of all that, here's what the Republicans and the corporate Democrats like Joe Manchin accomplished. Here's Senator Shelley Moore Capitol. This legislation will ratify approvals issued under the Biden administration from the U.S. Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, and the Fish and Wildlife Service, along with approval from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. These documents will be insulated from judicial review to prevent further delays. Additionally, the bill requires the Army Corps of Engineers to issue necessary project permits including that 404 permit I talked about earlier, within 21 days. And the language in this law is really quite stunning. It says, quote, Congress hereby ratifies and approves all authorizations, permits, verifications, extensions, biological opinions, incidental take statements, and any other approvals or orders issued pursuant to federal law necessary for the construction and initial operation at full capacity of the Mountain Valley Pipeline, unquote. It also says, quote, no court shall have jurisdiction, unquote, to review, quote, any approval necessary for the construction and initial operation at full capacity of the Mountain Valley Pipeline, including any lawsuit pending in a court as of the date of enactment of this section, unquote. In over a decade of reading laws, I've never seen anything quite like this before. I've never seen all permitting requirements waived and all lawsuits prohibited. I've seen it tried by Republicans for the Keystone XL Pipeline, but I've never seen it accomplished in law. And this law also had something that I've seen attempted by Republicans many times, but never actually accomplished. And that is the gutting of the National Environmental Policy Act in general. So first, the new law changes what will be studied in environmental reviews. Studies will now have to include, quote, any negative environmental impacts of not implementing the proposed agency action, unquote. So they're going to have to study the consequences of not doing what a company wants. The studies will also have to analyze, quote, irreversible and irretrievable commitments of federal, federal, federal resources, unquote, if the company gets its permits. Now, the federal part of that is new. And the way I read this, it looks like it would narrow the resources that would be considered. So if a company wants to irreversibly commit state, local or tribal resources, will that no longer have to be considered in the reports? And the way I read this I don't think so. 
the data that will also be used in the environmental studies will also be changed. And so from now on, agencies will be allowed to use, quote, any reliable data source, unquote, which I read as allowing private research paid for by the industries that want that project to be used, which is a suspicion bolstered by the provision that requires agencies to allow a, quote, project sponsor, unquote, so a company to prepare environmental assessments and environmental impact statements under the supervision of the government agency. And the government agency will, quote, evaluate, unquote, the documents and, quote, shall take responsibility for the contents, unquote. You know, the last Congressional Dish episode about the Norfolk Southern train that derailed in Ohio, that episode was all about how our law enforcement agencies are allowing corporations to police themselves under government supervision and how horribly that is working out for us. This new law is an expansion of corporate self-policing by allowing corporations to do their own project approvals now, too. And this new law then says that the government will take responsibility for whatever crap studies the companies produce. Only a corporate mole in government would think this is a good setup for the government, because this is absolutely nuts. And even when the approval process is conducted by corporation or government... The approval process is going to be limited regardless of the size or complexity of the proposed project. And so first, the new law assigns roles for lead agencies and cooperating agencies, which says that the agencies together will only produce a single environmental document, which, fine, duplication is wasteful. But it then sets a 150-page limit on environmental impact statements and a 300-page limit for a proposed agency action with, quote, extraordinary complexity, unquote. On top of that, there's going to be a 75 page limit on environmental assessments. And in addition to these page limits, there's also going to be time limits. And so environmental impact statements will have to be completed in under two years after that statement is ordered by the agency. And environmental assessments will have to be completed in one year. However, the agency may extend the deadlines. But they now run the risk of being sued because the new law also gives companies the right to take government agencies to court for failure to meet a deadline. And as we heard for ourselves in the last episode, the EPA right now is refusing to govern the cleanup process for the release of toxins in East Palestine, Ohio, because of a fear of a corporate lawsuit. And so provisions like this do handcuff our government in the real world when it should take action. But on top of all that, the new law also creates circumstances when impacts to the environment will not have to be evaluated at all. And along this line, in a change of a single word that will likely have huge negative impacts to all kinds of innocent creatures, the new law will only require environmental impact statements when the action has a, quote, reasonably foreseeable significant effect on the quality of the human environment, unquote. That word human wasn't in the law before. And so if a company wants to do something that affects an animal or a plant's environment, that will no longer matter. And this is the provision that I hate the most. The only thing that gave me any comfort at all, and it's really not that much, about these horrible changes to the National Environmental Policy Act, which I've seen the Republicans try to weasel into law for so many years, is the dismay expressed by one of the members of the Party of Pollution, Republican representative from Texas, Chip Roy. Here he is in the Rules Committee bitching about the new law the night before it passed in the House. And just so you know, in this clip, he's going to reference H.R. 1, which is not the H.R. 1 that I read in a previous Congress that the Democrats wrote that would have strengthened the security of our elections. H.R. 1, the Republican version, passed earlier in this Congress, and it's a package of bills that were blatant gifts to the polluting industries. It has zero chance of getting through the Senate, and so I didn't bother making an episode out of it. But that's what he's referring to in this Rules Committee speech. And so here's Chip Roy of Texas. Look, I'm for NEPA reforms, uh, 100%. We, we need them for road projects, transportation, but particularly for our energy industry. But my concerns here are that we've got language that none of us have fully reviewed going through the committees of, of jurisdiction that has been adopted, that I've got colleagues texting me and saying they're not 100% sure if, the, if that language is good or bad for the purpose intended. I've got colleagues on both sides of the aisle that have raised those questions. And so the purpose intended, of course, is to streamline projects, whatever those projects may be. But I've got a text right here from a GOP colleague saying, well, I'm not so sure that these will actually do what we think they will do to streamline said projects. And in fact, a former high up in the administration, in the energy department, under the Trump administration, 
just validated that concern by one of my colleagues. Yet we are putting forward this measure, saying this is some grand improvement with respect to NEPA, that that's somehow something we should be applauding when it's not the full package of H.R. 1, which had gone through committee. And importantly, the one thing that I think is 100% clear is that this bill fails to include even the most basic reform to uh, President Biden's unreliable unreliable energy subsidies that were put forward in the so-called Inflation Reduction Act for the wealthy elites, corporations, and the Chinese Communist Party, just to be blunt, and, and frankly, it ensures that permitting reform will likely benefit renewables the most. Basically, if you're a government that is subsidizing the crap out of something, in this case, unreliable energy, giving massive subsidies to billion-dollar corporations, giving significant subsidies to families that make over 100000 and 300000 for EVs because you're chasing your, your uh, you know, dreams of, you know, a fossil fuelless world, um, you're going to absolutely decimate our grid because you're not going to have the projects being developed for the gas and the coal and the nuclear that are actually required to keep your grid functioning. But yet, that's that's what we're that's what we're doing, and I just like me can't understand why we're applauding that. And so maybe we can take some solace in his tears. At least those of us that don't champion polluting industries the way he does in return for the over half a million dollars in campaign donations that we know of that he's taken from people in the oil and gas industry. But that is what the Republicans accomplished. The blanket approval and immunity from lawsuits for Joe Manchin's beloved Mountain Valley fossil fuel pipeline and what I see as a substantial gutting of environmental law. That's what they fought for and actually gained, all under the guise of fighting to reduce our nation's debt, which their law most likely will not actually do. But you know what? Okay, congressional Republicans, you just spent months demanding a national conversation about the debt in order to get this environmental nightmare into law. So you want to have a quick conversation about the debt? Fine, let's f***ing go. Because the debt has increased dramatically since the turn of the century, and it's no secret as to what happened to our money. Here's Representative Marcy Captor of Ohio. Let me remind folks, America's debt, which has to be paid, didn't begin to accumulate in the last two years. The last time our nation balanced a budget was during the Clinton presidency. That was largely possible because of budgetary defense savings made possible by the peace dividend following the fall of the Soviet Union. Since then, our nation has fought an extended war on terrorism at a cost of, listen, $8 trillion and 900,000 lost lives. Further, our communities are still digging out of the horrible Wall Street-induced housing crash of 2008. And we've been turning the corner on recovery from the massive pandemic that killed over one million of our friends and family members. And our health system is still struggling to recover from that. And the Republican Party just had a giant hissy fit about that debt and did so while taking no responsibility for their party's role in running up the bill. Here's Representative Mike Flood of Nebraska, a Republican, on May 24th. By contrast, dysfunctional Democrats have ignored the exploding national debt, even though it was their reckless spending that brought us here in the first place. And here's Republican Representative Ben Klein of Virginia on May 16th. Our financial stability today has spiraled out of control because of President Biden and the Democrats' reckless spending to fund their radical agenda. Now our nation faces an unsustainable $31.7 trillion in debt. But the debt has increased steadily during my 41-year-old lifetime, regardless of what party controlled the budget process in Congress. When I was born, the national debt was under a trillion dollars. How adorable. And now it's over $31 trillion and steadily increasing. And so I wanted to know, how did this happen? Well, lucky for me, the Senate Budget Committee recently held a hearing examining that very question, where the debt came from. And I listened to this hearing to try to get some numbers that would explain why our debt keeps expanding, despite our government not really providing anything additional to us here at home in return for our tax investments. And especially not as much as what other countries get for similar tax investments in other countries, especially in Europe. And Bobby Kogan provided exactly what I was looking for. Bobby Kogan is the Senior Director for Federal Budget Policy at the Center for American Progress. 
Bobby Kogan used to work for both Senator Patty Murray, a Democratic senator representing Washington state, and independent senator from Vermont, Bernie Sanders. And more recently, he worked in the Biden-Harris administration as an advisor to the director of the Office of Management and Budget, where he assisted with the American Rescue Plan and the Inflation Reduction Act, a law that was fully paid for and is budget neutral, by the way. And so if you want to know more about that law and how the numbers worked out, I read it for you. Go and check out that episode. And so, yes, this guy, Bobby Kogan, he does have a Bernie bro type pedigree, but his resume includes work on an actual law which didn't increase the debt. So I kind of believe that he knows how to balance a budget. And he had the wonkiest testimony full of data and charts that weren't based entirely upon estimates, but instead an examination of recent history and a comparison of what was projected back then to what is happening now. And here is what he found. Today, I intend to make two points. First, without the Bush tax cuts, their bipartisan extensions, and the Trump tax cuts, the ratio of debt to GDP would be declining indefinitely. And second, our rising debt ratio is due entirely to these tax cuts and not to spending increases. Throughout this testimony, when I say spending, I mean primary spending. That is, spending excluding interest on the federal debt. And every mention of revenues, spending, deficits, and debt means those amounts as a percent of GDP. Okay, according to CBO, primary deficits are on track to stabilize at roughly 4% over 30 years, high enough to cause the debt to rise indefinitely. The common refrain that you will hear, that I heard when I staffed this committee, and that unfortunately I expect to hear today, is that rising debt is due to rising spending. Revenues have been roughly flat uh, since the 1960s, and while spending was also roughly flat until recently, demographic changes and rising health care costs are now pushing the costs up. These facts are true. Our intuitions might reasonably tell us that if revenues are flat and spending is rising, then the one changing must be to blame. But our intuitions are wrong. In CBO's periodic long-term projections earlier this century, spending was projected to continue rising. But despite this, CBO routinely projected long-term debt stability. It's projected revenues, it projected revenues to keep up with this rising spending not due to tax increases, but due to our tax code bringing in more as our country and the people in it prospered. That prosperity results in both higher revenue collection and higher real after-tax income for the people whose incomes are growing. It is a win-win. In other words, we used to have a tax system that would fully keep pace with rising spending. And then the Bush tax cuts were enacted and expanded, and then on a bipartisan basis, eventually made largely permanent in 2013. Under the law dictating CBO and OMB's baseline construction, temporary changes in tax law are assumed to end as scheduled. In practice, this meant that CBO's projection showed the Bush tax cuts ending on schedule, with the tax code then reverting to prior law. 2012 was therefore the last year in which CBO's projections reflected the Bush tax cuts expiring. Yes, CBO's 2012 long-term projections showed rising spending but it also showed revenues exceeding spending for all 65 years of its extended baseline. With indefinite surpluses, CBO showed debt declining indefinitely. But ever since the Bush tax cuts were made permanent, CBO has showed revenues lower than spending and has projected debt to rise indefinitely. And since then, the Trump tax cuts further reduced revenues. Without the Bush tax cuts, their bipartisan extensions, and the Trump tax cuts, debt would be declining indefinitely, regardless of your assumptions about the alternative minimum tax. Two points explain this. The first employs a concept called the fiscal gap, which measures how much primary deficit reduction is required to stabilize the debt. The 30-year fiscal gap is currently 2.4% of GDP, which means that On average, primary deficits over 30 years would need to be 2.4% of GDP lower for the debt in 2053 uh, 2053 to be equal to what it is now. The size of the Bush tax cuts, their extensions, and the Trump tax cuts under current law over the next 30 years is 3.8% of GDP. Therefore, mathematically and unequivocally, without these tax cuts, debt would be declining as a percent of GDP, not rising. And the timeline of this testimony lines up. The U.S. government has run a deficit averaging nearly a trillion dollars every year since 2001, meaning that our government spends much more in money than it receives in taxes and other revenue. Put another way, since the beginning of the George W. Bush years and the enactment of the first installment of aggressive Republican tax cuts, our national bills have been higher than our income by about a trillion dollars per year. 
And Bobby Kogan testified that it had not been for the tax cuts, our debt levels would have been sustainable, even though our overall spending actually increased and would continue to increase year over year. And here's why that is. Right. So um, our demographic changes in rising health care costs are the reason that spending is increasing. If you break spending into two categories, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, everything else, including the everything else entitlements, the everything else is shrinking as a percent of GDP. Uh, and it's the Medicare, Medicaid and Social Security that are growing. And they are growing not because they are getting more, they're doing more. It's not because we're giving more and more to, to seniors uh, and, to, and, to, uh, and to extremely poor people, but because it costs more to do the same. That is the rising, that is the demographics that's changing the ratio of non-workers to workers, and it is also the rising health care costs. And so what this means is that if you want to spend less, you are necessarily saying that future seniors should be getting less of a benefit than they're currently getting. That's the only way to do it. Since that's the portion of the budget that's growing, if you want to cut that, you have to say that the current amount that we're doing for Social Security recipients, the current amount that we're doing for seniors, the current amount that we're doing for people on Medicaid is too much, and future people should be having less. That's the only way to do it. Um, and you know, and the, the, the very nice thing that I had, though, is in my testimony, we used to have a tax system that, despite that rising, would keep up with that, and now we don't. Another witness asked to testify in the hearing about our debt was Bruce Bartlett. Bruce Bartlett was at one time a high-ranking, trusted economic policy advisor to the patron saint of Republicans, President Ronald Reagan. He then became the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the Treasury Department during the presidency of George H.W. Poppy Bush. In the private sector, Bruce Bartlett has been paid by Wall Street companies to help them make money, and he has worked at free market think tanks. And so this guy is no Democrat. When he was a Republican, because he's an independent now, but he was the kind of Republican that made my own fiscally responsible father and accountant think that he belonged in the Republican Party because Bruce Bartlett considers debt to be a bad thing. And he participates in serious discussions about the origins of debt and how it could be reduced. I did find him credible, especially because of his political independence. And he shared his thoughts on a problem with the way that income is collected in the United States. Well, first of all, I think in terms of tax shelters and tax evasion and extreme levels of tax avoidance, the problem isn't so much with the law as with the enforcement. And as you know, uh, it's been the policy of Republicans to slash the budget of the IRS in real terms uh, for many years, uh, which is a way of giving uh, privatizing tax avoidance Uh, to rich people and the rich individuals have the greatest power and ability uh, to evade taxation. Uh, And and I think it was really wonderful that uh, the Congress uh, increased the the IRS's budget. Uh, And I think it's just the height of absurdity uh, that one of the major uh, elements of the House Republican proposal is to slash the IRS's budget again, even though uh, the CBO has has said this is a revenue-losing proposition. A buddy of Ronald Reagan just said that. My God. (laughs) And a party that cares about the debt wouldn't do such a thing. But what I found especially useful about this hearing was that there were other possible solutions to the debt problem that were suggested, including some that are already being considered by the Biden administration. So first up, here's Samantha Jacoby. She's the senior tax legal analyst at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Wealthy people who get their income from investments accumulate large gains as those assets go up in in value over time. But they won't owe income tax unless they sell their assets. If they never sell, no one will ever pay income tax on those gains. That's arguably the biggest flaw in the tax code. Policymakers should consider a tax like President Biden's budget proposal to enact a minimum tax on very wealthy households. This would treat unrealized capital gains, which is the primary source of income for many wealthy households, as taxable income, instead of letting income accrue tax-free across generations. We can have reasonable disagreements about what level of taxation is fair for people in different income brackets. But who actually thinks it's fair for rich people to have large sources of increasing wealth that are not taxed at all? If a party is serious about combating the debt, this proposal shouldn't be out of bounds. And here's another suggestion made by the buddy of Reagan and Daddy Bush, Bruce Bartlett. And in this portion of his testimony, he's going to mention Medicare Part D, which was an unpaid for program that provided tax money for prescription drugs for people over the age of 65, which of course helps elderly Americans afford to live 
but it was also a massive gift to the pharmaceutical industry. Anyway, here's Bruce Bartlett. The reason I changed my mind about taxes and decided that we needed tax increases happened on a specific day that I'm sure Senator Grassley remembers, if nobody else. And that was the day in November of 2003 when the Medicare Part D legislation passed. And I was just, you know, at the time, I thought the reason Republicans, and I was a Republican in those days, were put on this earth was to control entitlement programs. And I was appalled that an entirely new entitlement program was was created that was completely unfunded. It raised the deficit forever by about 1% of GDP. And I thought a dedicated tax should have been enacted along with that program, uh, which I didn't oppose and don't oppose. In fact, I benefit from it at my age. Uh, But uh, I I just think that we need proper funding. And that was when I first started saying we needed to raise taxes because we just can't cut uh, um, discretionary spending enough uh, to uh, fix the problem. And I think this is the error of the House uh, budget, which is cuts almost entirely uh, domestic discretionary spending, doesn't even touch defense. And I just think that's extraordinarily unrealistic and an unserious approach to our deficit problem. Uh, we simply have to do something about entitlements if you're going to control spend, uh, control the budget on the spending side. I don't think we're going to do that. I think we need a new tax. I have advocated a value-added tax for many years as a supplement to our existing tax system. It, it creates, it, you can raise a lot of revenue from it. Every, virtually every industrialized country has one. The money could be used to fix things in the tax code as a, a tax reform measure. Once upon a time in the 70s and even the 80s, it was considered the sine qua non of Republican tax policy because it's a consumption-based tax system, a flat tax. And and now many Republicans are in favor of something called the fair tax, which is very similar except that it won't work. Uh, Administratively, it's poorly designed. Uh, The the value-added tax will work, and that's why it should be a better Uh, uh, approach to these problems. I'm speaking to you right now from a hotel in Mexico City. And when I check out of here, I'm going to pay many hundreds of dollars in value-added tax. I paid hundreds of dollars in value-added tax to hotels in Poland and Portugal last year. And I've seen it on my receipts for clothes and food in pretty much every country that I've visited. And I've been to over a dozen at this point. Outside of the United States, a value-added tax on the things you buy is everywhere. And it seems fair. Because it's not based on what you have or how much money you make. Everyone pays the same amount, and it's based entirely upon how much you consume. If a party is serious about combating the debt, this proposal shouldn't be out of bounds. But even if the Republicans continue to insist that we can only cut our way out of debt, despite all of the evidence to the contrary, the Biden administration has ideas for reducing mandatory spending, reducing entitlement spending, and ways that save the government money while not costing you or your parents or your grandparents anything more out of pocket. Here's Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland. And President Biden's budget also has cuts in it. In fact, what the president has proposed is that the Medicare program pay big pharma, pay the pharmaceutical industry a little less for the drugs that the Medicare program purchases. After all, all of us in this room and every American citizen contribute billions and billions of dollars every year to really important work done at the National Institutes of Health, which is headquartered in my state of Maryland. It's an American treasure. It is an amazing place, and it's a great engine of invention. We spend billions and billions of dollars in taxpayer every year for them to do research that has uncovered really important cures and really important treatments and helped the pharmaceutical industry develop a lot of the drugs. And yet, Big Pharma uses the research developed with taxpayer dollars and then often turns around and sells those drugs at prices that American taxpayers can't afford. And so what President Biden has proposed is that they take a little less, we give them even more 
We give the Medicare program even more negotiating authority so that we can reduce those costs to Medicare and to uh, the taxpayer. So he's proposed those kind of cuts. If a party is serious about combating the debt, that proposal shouldn't be out of bounds. And yet to the Republicans, it is. All of these ideas are. The fact of the matter is that the Republican Party is not serious about reducing our debt. If they were, they wouldn't be hell-bent on continuing the same fiscal policies that were the main causes of the debt to begin with. Here's Senator John Thune of South Dakota in May in separate speeches on the Senate floor. And before Democrats suggest it, let me just say that taxing the rich will not provide enough money to dig us out of the hole that we're in. Mr. President, we're at an inflection point right now when it comes to tax policy and to our economy. Key parts of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act are set to expire in the not-too-distant future. And certain provisions, provisions that help boost American innovation and make it easier for small and medium-sized businesses to thrive, have already expired. And there are two ways we could go. We can either maintain and build on Tax Cuts and Jobs Act policies designed to help businesses grow and expand opportunities for American workers, or we can move in the direction the President is moving which is dismantling pro-growth provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and making tax hikes the focus with the intent not of growing the economy, but of growing the federal government. And I will do everything that I can to prevent the tax, the president's job-killing tax hikes from being implemented. And in case you have any doubt about how unserious the Republicans are about the debt, there's this fact about what's going on in the budget process right now. Here's Representative Joe Neguse of Colorado. He's a Democrat speaking to Representative Jason Smith, a Republican who is the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. And this was in the Rules Committee the night before the vote took place on that new law. And FYI, though, he doesn't speak. Ron Estes is the Republican chair of the Budget Committee, and he's going to be addressed. And just so you know, he's sitting right next to the Republican chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, Jason Smith. Get a load of this. The president put forward a budget months ago. Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Smith, do you know when the president submitted his budget to the United States Congress? I don't remember, but it was... It was March it was, 9th. It was late. It was due February 1st. Oh, I'm glad you noted that. Chairman Smith, when did the Republicans submit their budget? Uh, you would need to ask the budget... I would need to ask the budget... <laughs> well, Mr. Estes, when did the Republicans submit their budget? Only in the Rules Committee, by the way, could a witness lay blame at the president for being a few weeks late in submitting his budget when his party hasn't submitted a budget, period. You know, all the Republicans squawking about the debt and the budget, and they haven't even offered their proposals in the actual government funding process yet. You guys, it's June. This process of creating 12 funding bills in the House and either getting them approved by the Senate or forming conference committees to work out the differences before both parts of Congress vote on the final versions, this is a whole process that's supposed to take nine months. It's Congress's most basic job, and the due date is September 30th. Here I am speaking to you in June, and these Republicans aren't even over the starting line yet. The Republicans in this Congress don't care about the debt. Because at the same exact time that they were saying that our debt levels are unacceptable and we must cut, 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 the Republicans, in literally the same speeches, would pivot and advocate for increasing spending. Here's the leader of the Republicans in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, on the Senate floor on May 2nd. The deal the House passed last night is a promising step toward fiscal sanity. Uh, But make no mistake... There's much more work to be done. The right to the fight to reel in wasteful spending is far from over. Our obligation to provide for the common defense is especially urgent. For years, Republicans have led significant investments in improving the readiness of our armed forces and modernizing their capabilities to face down emerging threats. But since President Biden took office, Republicans have had to fight year after year to ensure we meet the needs of our military. Fortunately, we've secured bipartisan recognition that President Biden's budget requests have underfunded our national defense. 
This was especially true last year when Republicans secured a substantial real dollar increase to defense funding and ended Democrats' artificial demands for parity with non-defense discretionary spending. This brought our military valuable time, but it was hardly a silver bullet. As I said yesterday, President Biden's refusal to let the defense portion of this agreement exceed his insufficient budget request is certainly disappointing. And you should know that there's another very expensive project that is being pushed for by Republicans in Congress right now. Here's Senator John Kennedy of Louisiana on the Senate floor on May 2nd. We should be innovating and preparing our nuclear arsenal for this new global dynamic, but instead our nuclear stockpile remains stuck in the Cold War. And that is just a fact. Put simply, America's nuclear stockpile is old and it is shrinking. And while modernizing our nuclear arsenal should be a top priority, our effort to restart nuclear weapon production has been riddled with delays and poor planning. And we do not, we do not have time to waste. So let me get this straight. Our debt is unsustainable, and yet we should increase our war spending and start a whole new nuclear weapons production program. (laughs) You know, I'm with Jim McGovern of Massachusetts in his reaction to the this whole dynamic that he expressed in the Rules Committee on the eve of the vote on the new law. I I continue to be stunned by the fact that uh, when I look at uh, this deal, which focuses on discretionary funding, that the people who seem to be asked to do the most or to absorb the hits the most are the people that least can afford it. I mean, the military budget is part of this discretionary budget. It's over 50 percent of the discretionary budget. The United States spends more on national defense than China, Russia, India, Saudi Arabia, United Kingdom, Germany, France, South Korea, Japan, and Ukraine combined. Yet, if this moves forward, we see an increase in defense spending. I mentioned it in my opening remarks. I don't know how many of you saw it. I mean, the the 60 Minutes piece the other day. We wondered why the Pentagon is finding it hard to procure weapons it needs at a price taxpayers can afford. A six-month investigation by 60 Minutes found it has less to do with foreign entanglements than domestic ones, what can only be described as price gouging by U.S. defense contractors. Perhaps no one understands the problem better than Shea Assad, now retired after four decades negotiating weapons deals. In the 1990s, he was executive vice president and chief contract negotiator for defense giant Raytheon. Then he switched sides. Under Presidents George W. Bush, Barack Obama, and Donald Trump, Assad rose to be the Defense Department's most senior and awarded contract negotiator. To Assad's former defense industry associates, he was the most hated man in the Pentagon for his dogged scrutiny of their pricing practices. The Pentagon, he told us, overpays for almost everything. This bill is an oil pressure switch that NASA used to buy. Well, their oil switch, with all of the cabling, cost $328. This oil switch, we paid over $10,000 for it. So what accounts for that huge difference? Gouging. What what else can account for it? What level of profit are we talking about? Well, if the average profitability that was negotiated in a firm fixed price contract was typically between 12 and 15 percent. So a company can make 12. That's a good profit. Sure. But Shea Assad told us Pentagon analysts found total profits approached 40 percent. A Department of Defense study released last month found major contractors flush with tens of billions of Pentagon dollars to hand out to shareholders. No matter who they are, no matter what company it is, they need to be held accountable. And right now, that accountability system is broken in the Department of Defense. So does that affect our readiness? There's no doubt about it. You just can only buy so much because you only have so much money. 
It wasn't always like this. The roots of the problem can be traced to 1993, when the Pentagon, looking to cut costs, urged defense companies to merge. 51 major contractors consolidated to five giants. The problem was compounded when the Pentagon, in another cost-saving move, cut 130,000 employees whose jobs were to negotiate and oversee defense contracts. It was the era of, you know, downsizing Absolutely. government, getting government out of it, let business... Let business do their thing. And it, it's, it's, it was ultimately a disaster. The Pentagon granted companies unprecedented leeway to monitor themselves. Instead of saving money, Assad told us the price of almost everything began to rise. In the competitive environment before the companies consolidated, a shoulder-fired Stinger missile cost $25,000 in 1991. With Raytheon, now the sole supplier, it cost more than $400,000 to replace each missile sent to Ukraine. Even accounting for inflation and some improvements, that's a seven-fold increase. And the U.S. has nowhere else to go. We have nowhere else to go. For many of these weapons that are being sent over to Ukraine right now, there's only one supplier. And the companies know it. In March, the Pentagon announced its largest budget ever, $842 billion. Almost half will go to defense contractors. While contract spending is going up, Pentagon oversight is going down through cuts and attrition. We met with recently retired auditors Julie Smith and Mark Owen and contracting officer Catherine Forsman, who are part of the downsizing. They told us with less oversight and Shea Assad now gone, the Pentagon is losing the battle to hold down prices. I mean, we all know. Uh, of the cost overruns uh, in the Department of Defense. And, uh, and we know, I mean, the idea that we're spending $10,000 for a $300 oil switch, um, I mean, this, it, it's, it's been there for a long time, and yet we seem unable to want to grapple with that, uh, with that waste uh, and those cost overruns. Uh, for, I, I don't know if it's the, it's the defense lobbyists or the campaign contributions or whatever it is, but somehow... When it comes to the military budget, you know, not only are we not holding them accountable, but, you know, we say, we're going to increase it even more, even more. We'll give you more. And more they do intend to give. Here's Republican Representative Tom Cole of Oklahoma on the House floor on May 31st. As for the military budget, my friend calls it bloated. Frankly, I think we should be spending more. But I remind him, we're giving the president what he asked for. So if this budget is bloated at the Pentagon, they can ask the White House about it because it's the budget that they proposed. And he's right. This is a bipartisan thing. Both parties keep increasing the military budget and doing nothing about the price gouging. But like we heard, there are savings to be had without having to reduce any actual equipment being purchased by the Pentagon. As 60 Minutes exposed, there is enormous opportunity to cut war costs just by refusing to pay the war industry monopolists 40% in profits. And so let's do some back of the napkin math here. The new law caps war spending, at least the war spending they admit is war spending, at $886 billion. Half of that we know is going to go to defense contractors. So that's $443 billion of our tax money that's going to be funneled to those companies in just one year. 40% of that money is apparently being siphoned out to shareholders as profit. And so if we were to cap their profit margins derived from sales to taxpayers at a totally reasonable 10%, 30% of the money we funnel to these companies could be saved. That's $133 billion next year. And if we continued to do that over 10 years, which is what debt projections usually analyze, that would be a savings of over $1.3 trillion. That's the same savings that the new law in theory would save, but we could do it by removing war profiteering payments to the shareholder class instead of taking money away from elderly Americans who need homes, sexual assault victims, community health care centers, law enforcement, etc., etc., etc. But these ideas are out of bounds for Republicans. Because they do not care about the debt. They use the debt. This is all ideological. These Republicans that we have in office right now, many of them hate government. 
And they use the debt as an excuse to make our government dysfunctional so that they can claim that it's dysfunctional and dismantle it some more. And they do this because, as we saw in the new law, in their actual accomplishments, they really want to dismantle government so that the private sector can govern itself and maximize the profit returns to shareholders so that money can be funneled to the people who are already wealthy enough to own stock, who are wealthy enough to make bets on the stock market. These Republicans are serving the rich. They get their power from campaign contributions given by the rich. And in a lot of cases, they are the rich. They are the business owners. They brag about it all the time. They are the shareholders. They are the ones trading on the stock market, often on the insider knowledge about upcoming changes to law that they themselves are writing. And unfortunately, that describes a lot of Democrats in Congress, too. But it was the Republicans that just created an unnecessary crisis that made us look irresponsible to the rest of the world because we are being irresponsible. And the Republicans said it was because they are so fiscally responsible. They even named the damn law the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2023. Come the f on. The Republicans don't care about the debt. They use it as an excuse to dismantle our government. How much more proof do you need? Okay, fine. Here's Republican Representative Chip Roy of Texas. I'll say it. I'll say it right here. I don't want the government doing most of the things that the government is doing to interfere with the ability of the American people to carry out their lives. Federal, state, and local. Chip Roy and the rest of the Republicans in this Congress and Congresses before this one have used the debt and the public's confusion about the debt ceiling's relationship to that debt to get changes to law that would dismantle government so that the private sector could make the rules instead to profit freely, regardless of how much more it costs you and I out of pocket. They failed when they tried to gut the Affordable Care Act using the debt ceiling as a hostage in 2013 on behalf of the insurance companies. But this year, on behalf of the fossil fuel companies and other polluters and real estate developers like Donald fucking Trump, who hate that our government ever stands in the way of their accumulation of profit, on their behalf, the Republicans got real changes to law, environmental law. After many years of trying, the debt ceiling hostage strategy worked. Here's Representative Jim McGovern, who's been in Congress through all of these unnecessary debt ceiling crisis debacles. And on May 31st, he once again channeled my thoughts exactly. By weaponizing the debt ceiling, Republicans are establishing a precedent that will haunt us forever. That one party can use the full faith and credit of the United States as a hostage to pass their wildly unpopular ideas that they could not get done through the normal legislative process. It's a lousy, lousy, lousy way to govern. And Representative Teresa Lega Fernandez of New Mexico spoke on the House floor that same day about what needs to be done. This crisis didn't have to happen. Everything in this bill could have been negotiated through the normal process without a debt crisis crisis. Indeed, that's how it's almost always been done, except for in 2011 when the Republicans did this before. Expired. The American Gentleman people need to tell the reserves. Republicans Gentleman no Massachusetts more reserves. The gentlelady's time's expired. And while she is right... The problem is that the American people don't understand any of this. We don't know what actually happened in this law because most of the coverage was about who won in the political battle. Was it Kevin McCarthy or was it Joe Biden? No one was really talking about what was in the actual law. And so Americans don't know that the long term effect of this law is not going to be a substantial reduction in the debt, but instead a substantial reduction in environmental reviews of corporate projects. The American people also don't understand how the government is funded. I know I didn't before I started producing this show, which I started producing because I didn't know where to find out what Congress was doing, as opposed to finding out the politics of what the people in the Congress were saying and who is up in the next election's polls. And so I started creating the podcast that I wished existed in this country. But very few Americans have done that. Very few Americans really know the difference between a debt ceiling negotiation and a budget negotiation. And so the idea that Americans are going to hold Republicans accountable for any of this, I have exactly zero hope that that will happen before the debt ceiling returns in 2025. And so unfortunately, we are in the unenviable position of having to count on the Democrats to prevent the Republicans from doing this again. 
And next time, what I want to see happen is a move introduced to the world by Keanu Reeves. Because remember the movie Speed, the first one, the good one, where Jeff Daniels and Keanu Reeves are cops dealing with a terrorist mastermind? Remember this scene? All right, pop quiz. Airport, gunman with one hostage. He's using her for cover. He's almost to a plane. You're a hundred feet away. Shoot the hostage. What? Take her out of the equation. Go for the good wound and you can't get to the plane with her. Clear shot. You're deeply nuts, you know that? Shoot the hostage. (laughs) Well, Jeff Daniels' character may have thought the idea was nuts at first, but when he was the hostage, what did Harry tell Keanu to do? Shoot the hostage. (laughs) Say goodbye, Harry. And it worked. And so next time the debt ceiling is used as a hostage by the Republicans or the Democrats who haven't done it yet, but have a long history of being shocked and dismayed by Republican behavior only to copy it a few years later when it's normalized, a possibility that's already being threatened by a Democrat. Here's Representative Jim Himes of Connecticut on the House floor. The implications here, and I try to make this case to my Republican friends, eventually we Democrats will learn from this level of irresponsibility. And the next time there's a Republican president, we will have a ransom list. Is this the way we want to legislate in the greatest country in the world? I don't think so. Well, the next time the debt ceiling is the hostage, it should be shot. And I don't really care who shoots it. And there are multiple guns that can be used. One of them is the 14th Amendment, which says, quote, the validity of the public debt of the United States authorized by law, including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services in suppressing insurrection or rebellion shall not be questioned, unquote. And so the president could create a constitutional crisis once and for all, because it seems crystal clear to me that the debt ceiling, a provision of law that prevents beyond questions, but prevents the payments of our bills is unconstitutional. And we should welcome lawsuits against the debt ceiling because the debt ceiling seems likely to lose. But there's another gun that's loaded and aimed at the debt ceiling as well. Here's Bruce Bartlett. I think there's absolutely no question that the debt limit is unconstitutional, under, not just under the 14th Amendment, Section 4, but under the, the general uh, powers of the president. I mean, one of the things that I will point out is that the debt limit is a very serious national security issue. A huge percentage of the national debt that is owned by foreigners is owned by foreign central banks. They are not going to be happy if, if their, their assets are suddenly worth a, a great deal less than they thought they were. I think the president has full power within his inherent authority uh, to, to simply declare the debt limit null and void. And I would point out that uh, um, e- that. that it's not a simple question of whether you just break the debt limit. I think a lot of people, even on this committee, forget the impoundment part of the Budget Act of 1974, which says you must, the president must spend the money that is appropriate by law. He doesn't have the choice not to, which is what some Republicans seem to think that he can do, and he he lacks that power. So so I, I would agree that the president has that power. I wish he would use it. I wish it as sincerely as anything I believe in life. Thank you. I'm with Bartlett. The president has weapons and should use them against the debt ceiling. And so in January 2025, hashtag shoot the hostage because the death of the debt ceiling is long overdue. So a former patron this week, took the time out of his probably not all that busy day to write to me to tell me that he has stopped supporting my work because I take the time at the beginning of the show to explain to people how I make money doing this work, which is through direct listener support. Patreon, paper checks, Venmo, Zelle, Cash App, gift cards, cryptocurrencies, whatever you want to send in when whatever amount you think is fair, I will happily accept because the value for value business model is all about trading value. And so I produce a podcast that has value, but I give it to the world up front for free. And even though I know via my other podcast, We're Not Wrong, that putting content behind a paywall is the best strategy for making money, this information is important. And so I don't do that. 
All the stuff I put behind the congressional dish pay wall is fun. And to that point, I know it's been a while. I just had a, let's just say pretty intense month of personal life stuff. Nothing serious, just a lot. And it's been a while since I've put anything on Patreon. And so let's do an Ask Me Anything on Patreon this week. So please support the show and submit your questions on the Ask Me Anything post that I will put on Patreon on Tuesday, June 13th. And please have your questions in by 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Friday, June 16th. And we will do a catch-up episode next weekend. But when it comes to the important information that I gather and research and provide sources for, All of the important stuff is available to everyone, including the freeloaders. I just think it's the right thing to do because not everyone can afford to pay, although I think most people can considering (laughs) I accept payments in as low as a dollar per month. But anyway, I do make a living from this job because some of you return the value you receive in whatever amount you feel is fair. And as long as the payments keep coming, I'll keep torturing myself and paying close attention to Congress, even though it keeps me up at night and sometimes feels like an exercise in masochism. But I do it for you because someone has to read these damn laws and summarize congressional investigations and watch the hearings and and generally pay attention to what Congress does as opposed to what they say and what the polls of the uninformed say about the politics of it all. And I tell people about this funding model because it's different from what most people are used to. And if I don't explain it, I don't get paid. I've been doing this for over a decade. The pattern is crystal clear. But apparently, for some people, listening to a few minutes of that explanation at the beginning of the episode, or pressing fast forward, which is an option on pretty much every podcast app that exists, well, that's just too much for some listeners of a free podcast to handle. And I know I'm picking on the guy who wrote to me this week because I was in the middle of reading a month's worth of the congressional record for him when his email interrupted that work and it pissed me off. But he's far from the first to express displeasure at the great inconvenience of the value for value exclamation segments. And so you know what? That got me to thinking. Maybe things have changed. You know, there are more people working in the infotainment business now who are not selling out to the corporations and using ads for funding who are also being funded directly by their listeners or readers. Maybe this isn't as unusual as it used to be. And maybe I don't have to explain the value for value business model at the beginning of the episodes anymore. And so let's give this another try. Because I would love, 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 love to get right to the show in the beginning of the episodes. I would love nothing more. But every time I have skipped the value for value explanations in the beginning of the episodes in the past, I have taken a pay cut, sometimes a substantial one. But I'll give you another try because I know you guys hate those segments. So you may have noticed that I didn't explain the value for value business model at the beginning of this episode. We just got right to the debt ceiling shit show. And so if you liked that, and if I get more than $500 in Venmo payments before I record the next episode, which is the number I picked because that's about what I was getting when I was reading every Venmo note on thank you episodes. But despite the promises that people would keep paying if I stopped doing those episodes, the Venmo payments have almost completely dried up. And so if we can get back to that 500 in episode level before I record episode number 276 at the end of June, I will just get right to the point in the beginning of the next episode and just leave the value for value segment for the end. I'm going to put this decision in your hands. And so if you hate the value for value reminders, if you think they are hurting the show being placed at the beginning of the episodes, if you think that pressing fast forward a few times is a pain in the finger and you don't want to do it, well, don't make me do those segments. I do them because I have to. And if I don't have to, I won't. So please send in some Venmos for whatever you think this episode or this podcast in general is worth. And we will see how this goes. And that's it for today, because for the second episode in a row, I have no executive producers to announce. And so if you have a message or feedback that you want shared with the entire Congressional Dish audience, now seems like a good opportunity for you to contribute $535 
or to contribute whatever amount will get you to a cumulative $535, which allows you to put your name on the episode you consider the most valuable, which moves it up the most valuable episodes list, which really helps new listeners figure out what they should listen to first. And it's your opportunity to have your own voice heard on an episode. Because by the way, you are welcome to submit brief voicemails along with your executive producer credits if you want to. The phone number, I think it's, I don't know, I don't remember it, but it's listed along with the sources for every episode on congressionaldish.com. But you can write a note or speak your piece at the Congressional Dish voicemail line. It's up to you. But I hope someone does before I record episode 276 sometime at the end of June. But until I come back with another episode about this fucked up show of a Congress, please listen to We're Not Wrong for my punditry takes along with Justin Robert Young and Andrew Heaton. And that is the show where we talk about current news of the week. It's a fun show. And I'm sure we're going to talk about the second indictment of Donald Trump. And I'm also sure that the boys will make me laugh while doing it, as they always do. We're Not Wrong is a happy show because I swear I am not always an angry shrew like I tend to be on Congressional Dish. You know, maybe someday we will elect responsible stewards of government who believe in the mission of government to fund our government. And so maybe one day I can be happy on this show, too. (laughs) You know, a girl can dream. But for today, that's it. So please remember to call your member of Congress and politely tell them that they suck and then go enjoy your day. Thanks for listening. Toodles. We don't have a domestic spying program. They're content to fight in black and white despite the many in between. We got a president who plays with the facts. With the facts. And then he waves a flag to cover his tracks. As if a lie is alright, if the end will justify the means. Now we are so damn tired of me. The polar ice caps aren't going away. We don't think we can deny it anymore. You can stick to your story if you think it lies. But we're not keeping quiet anymore. We are so damn tired of being lied. Government jobs consume the profits of the private sector. We don't think we can deny it anymore. These bills represent common sense, bipartisan solutions that actually solve problems. 